Olá, boa tarde a todos, obrigada pela presença. Nós vamos iniciar hoje a palestra Petróleo e Geologia Médica na África do Sul. Eu sou Tatiane Kombi, do Instituto de Geossciências da UFBA, eu vou ser moderadora aqui hoje. Uh, hello, everyone. We are starting our lecture today with Professor Hassina Mouri from the University of Johannesburg, South Africa. Uh, I'm Tatiane Kombi, I'll be the moderator today, so please feel free to make any questions in our chat uh, in Portuguese or English. We'll be happy to answer everything. Uh, so now I, I'm going to introduce you to Professor Antonio Fernando Queiroz and Professor Olivia Oliveira. Uh, they will set the, give them their welcome. É, vou fazer falar em português também, pessoal. É, vou passar a palavra então para a professora Olivia Oliveira, diretora do Instituto de Geossciências da UFBA. Professor Antônio Fernando Queiroz, representando a coordenação do Programa de Pós-Graduação em Geoquímica, Petróleo e Meio Ambiente, o Pós-Petro, que vão dar as boas-vindas à professora, a nossa palestrante de hoje, a professora Racina Mori, da Universidade de Joanesburgo, África do Sul. Por favor, professores. Obrigada, professora Tatiane. Saudações a todos. É um grande prazer e uma grande honra para o Instituto de Geociências da Universidade Federal da Bahia receber a professora Racina Mori para essa conferência. É, eu gostaria também de parabenizar a todos os membros do Programa de Pós-Graduação em Geoquímica, Petróleo e Meio Ambiente, Pós-Petro, pela organização dessa conferência. Então, a, a experiência, certamente, que a doutora Racina trará, será de grande proveito para os docentes e para os docentes. Eu passo a palavra ao professor Antônio Fernando, que fará um breve uh, resumo da apresentação né, da doutora Racina. Obrigado, professora Lívia. É um prazer muito grande estar com vocês hoje à tarde. E para iniciar, eu queria aproveitar, antes de fazer a apresentação formal da professora Racina Moura, é agradecer imensamente ao professor Manuel Jerônimo Moreira Cruz, do nosso programa de pós-graduação em Geoquímica, Petróleo e Meio Ambiente, e também a professora Tatiane Kombi, também do nosso programa, do nosso pós-petro, e a doutoranda Evelyn Franco, é, do pós-petro. O professor Jerônimo é, deu início a toda a negociação para nós termos é, as tratativas, né, para nós termos a professora Racina hoje aqui. E é com muito prazer, então, que a gente passa a apresentação da professora Racina. Né? Ela é do Departamento de Geologia da Universidade de, de Johannesburgo. Ela é detentora de vários prêmios, inclusive aquele recebido em 2014, que é o prêmio vice-reitora de liderança executiva da Universidade de Johannesburgo no Programa de Desenvolvimento. Ela tem uma formação educacional reconhecida internacionalmente, estudou e trabalhou em diversas instituições nos três continentes, África, Europa e América. É uma estudiosa fervorosa de petrologia metamórfica, de geologia de isótopos radiogênicos. E, antes de ingressar na Universidade de Joanesburgo, ela já trabalhou em várias instituições, como a Universidade de Paris, Museu Nacional de História Natural de Paris, Universidade de Helsinki, no Serviço Geológico da Finlândia, na, no Museu de História Natural da Suécia, na Universidade de Minnesota e na Universidade de Pretória, com atuação em vários outros países, né, nos seus trabalhos de pesquisa, a exemplo da Argélia, da Finlândia, da Colômbia Britânica, do Canadá e da Índia. Recentemente, a a doutora Racina tem se dedicado à geologia médica com foco em questões relacionadas ao continente africano. Ela é uma professora pesquisadora com inúmeras publicações científicas na temática da geologia médica, além de ser conferencista e palestrante em diversos eventos ligados à sua área de atuação. Muito obrigado, professora Racina. Thank you, professor Racina Mori. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Hassina, that was the introduction. 
of your amazing career and CV. Uh, and yeah, the floor is yours. I'll put your presentation on the screen. All right, thank you very much. Okay, so what shall I do now? Full screen, what shall I do? Is there anything I need to do from my side? Uh, just make it big so that I can see. Where is it? Hello? Uh, I hey, can't hey, see my hey, presentation. No, uh, no, you don't see your presentation on your computer? No, I don't see it. What is happening? Let me remove and add it again. I see myself, I see you, but I don't see the presentation. <laughs> uh, let's try to share it again. All right, let's just stop and then share again. Oh, let's share. Okay, let's take this window. Yeah, I think now it should work. Now it's, I think it's working now. Perfect, yeah. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Buen tarde to all of you uh, up there in, in Brazil and in, in the city of uh, Bahia. And thank you, Professor, for the very nice introduction. And thank you, all of you, for the invitation you extended to me so that I can share my modest knowledge in the field of medical geology with your students. I really appreciate it. And I'm honored and privileged with this opportunity. Um, so the presentation plan uh, more or less will be around three points. Uh, I thought I would say a few words about myself, who I am, but I think uh, uh, Professor made a very nice introduction. I don't think it's necessary for me to introduce myself anymore, but I will just perhaps summarize my background. Uh, then I will talk about medical geology in general, and then why Africa most uh, specifically. And then I share some examples of research that was conducted by my postgrad students here at the University of Johannesburg. Uh, I am South African Algerian. So I'm African. I graduated from the University of Algiers, and then I did my PhD at the University of Paris 7. And since I got my PhD, I moved a little bit around the world. I did some research in Europe, in North America. And then in 2000, I decided to come back to Africa where I spent the last 20 years at the University of Pretoria first, and then at the University of Johannesburg, where I am still working at present. Uh, my background is a metamorphic uh, petrologist with over 20 years experience, mostly in the study of Archean high-grade metamorphic rocks using geochemistry, petrology, and geochronology. However, since 2013, I decided to do something that is more applied, more relevant to our society, and I wanted to contribute to the challenges, especially uh, the challenges that uh, uh, are faced by the African continent in gen and, and the world in general. And that is when I decided to uh, um, specialize in medical geology. And uh, since then, I trained a number of postgrad students from different parts of Africa, including South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, Namibia, and Ghana. Sorry, I just need to move this little thing here. Okay, so. How can I move this slide? How is it? How does it work to move the slides? Okay, right. <clears throat> so what is medical geology in general? Or in other words, how geology is linked to health? 
I know that there is a lot of work has been done, which has been done in Brazil. Uh, I think uh, Brazil is one of the the countries where medical geology has been far advanced comparing to the rest of the world. And I'm sure that students who are listening to me at the moment are very familiar with uh, the discipline. However, I try to explain it in my own words and perhaps add some information in, into their knowledge. So our health is controlled by basically two main factors, the genetic factors and the environmental factors. The environmental factors are divided into two main uh, groups, which are the anthropogenic, which are caused by the man-made pollution and activities, synthetic fertilizers and so on. And then we have the geogenic or the natural geological uh, uh, processes, factors, materials and so on. And to this, I single out mining because it's actually a combination of both geogenic and anthropogenic. Uh, when we speak about mining, we speak about enhancing the release of the geogenic material into the environment through the mining, the activities. And if there are no natural resources in, in, in the environments, there wouldn't be uh, um, any harm through the mining activities. So by definition, uh, the, 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 or, or the discipline that deals with the impact, positive or negative, of such uh, uh, environment, including material processes factors on human health and animals and the ecosystem in general, it's what is called medical geology, which is based on an entire multi cross disciplinary approach bringing together a number of other disciplines or other experts from different disciplines, including geoscientists, and environmental scientists, biologists, biochemists, toxicologists, and so on. So, why medical geology is important? This discipline is a very important one because it helps to understand the causes or the sources of a wide range of health issues that are related to our environments. So if I sketch it in uh, this diagram, for example, we have the geoscientist that deals with the identification of the sources of the, disease, the diseases and from the other side, we have the health scientists which are dealing with the identification of the treatment of the diseases and in between all of this we have the role we have the toxicologist the chemist the biochemist the biologist and so on who play very important role also in um, the identification of both the source of the health and the treatment now, how is health linked to geology? In the past years, geology and health were considered as two different or two separate fields of science with no common uh, uh, purpose. However, recent advances in science have showed that the geology of an area can have direct or indirect impact on the regional input of elements and nanoparticles of minerals into soil, air, and water. And depending on the composition and the concentrations of this uh, uh, material, it can have harmful or beneficial health effects on humans, animals, plants, basically the ecosystem all together. So today I'm going to concentrate most on the harmful side of the geological material. Uh, but we must not think that geological material is harmful all the time. There are beneficial uh, aspects of it. It just 
but today I cannot cover that aspect. Now, what is the composition of geological material and how it is linked to our health? Because we said earlier that medical geology deals with the impact of the geological material on our health. So now, how can this material link to our health? We know that the mountains are made of rocks and the rocks are made of minerals and the minerals are made of chemical elements. Chemical elements are divided from a health point of view into essential elements which are necessary for our well-being and toxic elements which are detrimental to health. So here is the link now, the chemical elements, the periodic table. The periodic table is the common religion to all scientists. We use it in geological science, we use it in chemical science, we use it in biological science, we use it in health science, we use it basically in all science. So that is the common link between the health and the geology. So how are these chemical elements that are, can be beneficial or harmful to our health can be released into the environment? From a geological point of view, they can be released through different ways. First, for example, through rock weatherings. When rocks weather, they form soil. And when soil uh, sediments or, uh, is formed, the chemical elements are accumulated in this soil. And if we plant vegetables or any type of plants in this soil, Whatever is in it, it gets accumulated into the plants that we plant. So the soil, is, the plant, sorry, is basically the vehicle of what is found in the soil and uh, into our body. I will speak about this a little bit later. Then we have the dust. When, we, when rocks were there, they form very tiny particles which form dust and these nanoparticles are enriched sometimes in minerals that can be harmful to our health and float in the air. So if we breathe these minerals, we can, uh, depending on their nature and the composition, it can be harmful to our health. And then we have the rocks which interact with water or the soil that uh, resulted from weathering of the rocks that also interacts with water. And whatever is the composition of these rocks and soil, it gets dissolved and leached into water and it concentrates, the water concentrates the chemical elements, which then this water is used for drinking, for bathing, for irrigation. So therefore, if this water is polluted by chemical elements, these elements reach our body through this uh, medium. Other uh, ways how elements, chemical elements can be released into the environment, it includes more uh, uh, processes such as volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, floods, as I said earlier, dust storms, then I add to this human activities. I mentioned, about, I mentioned about mining earlier, which enhances the release of chemical elements into the environment. Quarrying for dimension stones is also another factor that uh, uh, enhances the release of chemical elements into the environment. And then, of course, petroleum industry is another way of uh, releasing uh, uh, chemical elements into the, uh, the, especially the harmful chemical elements into our environment. So now what are the exposure pathways? How are all these chemical elements and minerals reach our body? So our health is directly linked to geology through inhalation of the dust in the air. Okay, if we have dust, we inhale it we cause damage to our lungs through skin contacts, 
for example, when you wash uh, uh, with uh, uh, polluted water, or drinking that water, or even irrigating uh, plants with polluted water can be harmful. And of course, the food chain um, through vegetables, animals, and sometimes uh, through eating uh, earthy material, which I'm also going to talk a little bit later. So these are all the different ways or the different vehicles of what is found in our environment and uh, how it reaches our body and how it can uh, cause harm. So what is controlling now the effect of chemical elements on health? Okay, It's not that every chemical element that we, we, we are exposed to can be harmful. There are ways, there are fact, there are uh, 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 rules uh, that control the impact of these elements on our health. The first one is the right dose. These are the laws of toxicology. Serious health issues can result from either too high or too low doses of essential elements. If you remember earlier, I mentioned that the, in the periodic table, we have what we call essential elements that are needed for our health and the toxic elements which are harmful. So if we have too much or too less of those chemical elements that are required for the well-being, that's not good. If we have high doses of toxic elements, that is not good. So on this figure, for example, you have the frequency, the, 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 sorry, the, the, the health response to the concentration of elements, for example, less of uh, 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 essential elements or deficiency of essential elements in our diet is not good, it causes death. Too much of that is also not good. So the normal health is where you have a balanced diet in terms of essential elements. The second uh, rule or the second factor that controls the impact or the effect of geological materials on our health is our exposure, okay? So the long-term exposure to low doses or low concentrations of toxic elements can have exactly the same effect as short-term exposure to high concentrations of these elements. For example, Long-term exposure to low doses of radiation can increase the risk of developing high blood pressure, which is the cause of heart diseases, diseases and stroke, for example. Okay? Although we are exposed to small amount of radiation, but if we are frequently exposed to this amount, in a longer term, we develop the high blood pressure, which leads to the heart disease. For example, one of the minerals, from a geological point of view, one of the minerals that is known uh, uh, to be radioactive, it's what we call monazite, which is found basically in all uh, fersic rocks, uh, igneous and sedimentary. And it is highly radioactive because of the presence of thorium. We even have sands that are made of Monazite. So now imagine if you are living in an area where, are there, where there are all deposits of monazite, long-term exposure to, to, to this uh, material might be harmful to, to health. So now, um, of course, this, this, uh, there are other factors that control the, the effect of geological material on our health, such as the bioaccessibility, which is the fraction of an administered dose that is soluble in the receiving compartments, for example, the blood, or the bioavailability, which is the fraction of an administered dose that reaches the central compartment, the blood, in this case, in our case. And then, of course, we need to think about what we call optimum balance. What does, what does this mean? I will explain through an example. 
For example, if you have a uh, low diary, dietary sorry, uh, intake of iron and calcium, they enhance the lead absorption. If there is lead absorption in the environment where someone lives and they don't have enough iron and calcium in their diet, that will help uh, the absorption of lead. Another example, too much of calcium in our diet prevents the uptake of magnesium. So we might think that when we eat too much of calcium, we think that we are uh, doing some, uh, uh, some good for our health, but that is not good because it prevents the, the uptake of magnesium, which is very important for our health. Now, for example, vitamin C reduces the absorption of uh, lead by increasing the iron absorption which means that it decreases the ability of lead to compete with binding. That's why sometimes when we are uh, a, a little bit down, we, we, we are always advised to take vitamin C because that's it, it, incorrect, it, it actually boosts the immune system to fight against uh, um, such uh, uh, issues. So now let's move to Africa. Why medical geology in Africa? There are several reasons which I summarize here into two main reasons. The first one basically is that research in geology in the African continent is dominated by geological evolution, the processes, natural resources, especially in terms of, of evaluation mining exploration and petroleum geology studies this is basically what we when we speak about africa we speak basically about mining and petroleum exploration these are the two things that we we thought because the continent is rich in these uh, natural resources not much on the impact of these processes or material on human health and ecosystem in general. We, we don't have, we, do, we, we don't know about studies that deal with the impact of mining environments, for example, on health in Africa. There are, but very few. And forget about natural issues, such as health issues that are caused by volcanic uh, eruptions, which are very common on the African continent, the earthquake, for example, and, um, uh, and uh, the dust storms, uh, the floods, the drought, and, and so on. These are all the complex and dynamic characteristics of the geological history and evolution of the African continent relatively to other places in the world. I mean, when you think about how many uh, uh, the volcanic activity taking place in the, in, 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 on, the, on the continent, and when you think about the dust storms, as I say, the earthquakes and so on, it's, it's really enormous. And what is the impact of all this on our health? There is not much that has been done or known in, in, in this field. Now, from a health point of view, if we look at the World Health uh, Organization report, they defined, for example, uh, these five health issues as uh, what they call the non-communicable diseases, uh, which are the most dominant or the most responsible for death in, in the world in general. And about 41 million of people each year, roughly 71% of all death globally are caused by cardiovascular diseases, chronic respiratory diseases, cancer, diabetes, mental health conditions, and so on. Now, if we look at just African continent, no, sorry, before I move to the example about Africa, 
also in the report of the World Health Organization, they say that each year 15 million of people die from this uh, and from the NCDs between the age of 30 to 69 years old. And over 85% of these premature deaths occur in low and middle income countries. And Africa is one of these low to middle income countries. Uh, I mean, the countries in Africa are forming part of this category of countries. So now I can just imagine how many people are dying from these diseases which are non-communicable. I'm not even talking about the communicable diseases such as uh, uh, um, um, AIDS and, and uh, other uh, uh, diseases. Then the, 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 the NCDs are the results, they say. This is from the report. They say that they are the results of a combination of genetics. Of course, we cannot uh, deny that. Physiological and environmental factors, okay? So they do consider environmental factors as one of the important reasons of the NCDs. But there are no stud studies in medical geology where both the health and the environmental issue are brought together so that we can prove what what the part of the environment the, the, the part of the environment in the uh, in in causing this type of diseases now if we look at the the the, the um, statistics in africa i choose algeria and south africa because they are the um, one is the country of birth and the other one is where i am and if we look at the total number of uh, uh, the death from these five uh, NCDs, it's over 50% in North Africa, in Algeria, and 40% in, in South Africa. This is huge. And we cannot think this is all caused by genetics. It's impossible. There is part of the environment, and we can see that. So this is the reason why actually I wanted to embark in this uh, discipline of medical geology is actually to contribute to the understanding of the causes of these different diseases from environmental point uh, or geological point of view. So uh, in the second part of my presentation, I'm going to show some small examples because uh, as you might know, I started with medical geology recently. So I had to start from simple studies where I can also train uh, uh, young African to, to learn about this discipline and be the ambassadors of the discipline for further more sophisticated and complicated studies in future. I will show basically two types of examples. The first one is how chemical elements can cause or uh, are linked to health in the African continent. And these are the fluoride, for example, through an example of study in Kenya and the iodine, which is uh, uh, an iodine, uh, the iodine, sorry, from Nigeria. Both fluorine and iodine are essential elements to our health. But as we said earlier, too much is too much, cannot be uh, right. And the second example that I will uh, share with you is the impact of geological material on health in Africa, which is very common on the African continent, is what we call geophagy. Okay, so earlier I said I referred to this term or to this uh, uh, practice when I said that uh, one of the pathways of the chemical elements into our body is uh, the food chain. 
and I included the earthy material in the food chain, and this was what I was referring to. And here I will illustrate the situation with two examples, one from Namibia and one from Kenya. So let's start with the example, uh, the first example in, on essential elements, which is fluorine. And I believe this is very relevant to, uh, to the students in Brazil because uh, I, I, this is also, this is a common issue in some parts of, of the country. And this study was conduct conducted by Patrick Guevara, who is listening to me this evening. He's a Kenyan. Uh, student who um, worked on this project for his master's degree in uh, two years, three years ago, and now he's busy with uh, his PhD as a continuation on similar type of study where he extends uh, uh, his research uh, from fluoride to other uh, harmful elements in water, soil, and food and how that could affect the, the, the population in, in his country in Kenya. And the work, the, the, what I'm presenting this evening is a very short summary of the study. And if you are interested to uh, details about it, you will find uh, the information in two publications which were uh, uh, published in 2018 and 2019. Now, fluoride is an essential element. Uh, as you, it's, it's located here in the, in the periodic table. It occurs geologically in minerals such as fluoride, fluoride for example, uh, but there are other uh, minerals that are uh, uh, containing fluorine, uh, such as uh, micas, uh, fluoroapatites, and so on. But fluoride is the most uh, uh, the, the, where the fluorine occurs in uh, much high proportion. And the rocks uh, that uh, uh, contain minerals with fluorine uh, are Pigmatites, for example, vein deposits that are formed through hydrothermal activity, especially in limestone or any carbonate type of rocks. So the fluoride, however, is not only found in rocks, but it is also released during volcanic emissions as gas, which settles with the ash, forming high fluoride volcanic ash deposits. That is why, for example, in Kenya, uh, it's very important because of the geological setting of the, the, the country. I will explain a little bit later about this. So in terms of health, fluorine content between 0 0.5 to 1.5 milligram per liter is good to our health as it promotes growth and development of calcified tissues and uh, such as, for example, teeth and bones. You, you, if you have enough fluoride, the right dose, you will have beautiful teeth, uh, as you can see on this picture here. However, if the concentration of fluoride is higher than 1.5, uh, or sometimes below 0 0.5, it's not always high, the high content that is uh, harmful, remember what I said earlier, you will have dental and skeletal fluorosis, and which, which is not just uh, typical in human beings, but also in animals. For example, here you can see the teeth of a horse that are affected by fluorosis, okay? And this, this is an example of skeletal fluorosis in uh, a child from uh, India. Here you have some uh, references where I collected these images. Now I come back to the case study from, from, uh, from Kenya. You know where is Kenya? It's located in East Africa and you all Sorry, the study that is conducted by Patrick Guevara is in the central part of, uh, uh, of, uh, of Kenya, okay, in the Nakuru area, okay? And 
the, 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 Afri the Kenyan country forms part of the Kenyan rift, which is part of the East African rift system. Here is the East African rift system. Okay. And sorry, my little uh, 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 square moved up. It is actually the study was conducted in this area. And this rifting started about 30 to 35 years ago, and it stretches from Ethiopia to Mozambique. And all the volcanic activities are actually occurring along this rift. Now, when, when you think about the, the source of fluoride, not only from the rocks when they crystallize, but as I said, also through degassing uh, during volcanic eruption and um, settling uh, on the ash. Now, in the area where Patrick did his study, the, the challenges that people faced with, uh, uh, with this issue, with water in general, is they have very low coverage, poor maintenance of piped water, up to 30%, 36% of the population have access to, uh, to, um, to the piped water, and the water is highly enriched in fluoride. Okay. Now, like most of the African, not most, I would say all African countries, uh, people try to find solutions to their problems because that's the only way to survive. And for example, in this case, what they do because of low coverage of water, they drill boreholes in their own yard. And you know what what does does that mean there is no control on the quality of water they have no idea what they are drinking and because the high concentrations of fluoride can be actually tasted when they drink the water they taste it so they uh, uh, um, introduce uh, a, a system for defluoridation which is based on bone char method uh, uh, absorption. So this is the easy way for them to um, uh, somehow clean the water from, from fluoride. But there might be other chemical elements in the water that are very harmful to their health, but they don't know about it. It's just thanks to the taste, fluoride can be uh, sometimes easily detected. Now, Parallel to this study of water chemistry or geochemistry, we also did a clinical survey. Over 100, 100 uh, patients participated from two health clinics to, in, the, in the survey. And uh, the dental fluorosis screening conducted by qualified dentists and dental technicians in these two um, clinics. The results from this uh, 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 survey showed that there is a high prevalence of fluorosis in the area, up to 86%. It is higher in male, up to 90% than in female, and it's higher in younger patients, less, well, younger than 14 years old than older ones. But in terms of severity, most patients had the TF score of 3.5, which is a mild type of fluorosis. However, in the case of older patients, the severity is much higher than the young one. You can just understand why. Of course, they are exposed longer to, um, to the, the, the issue. Now, if I put together the... Um, the results of the geochemistry of water in terms of fluoride concentration, all the samples that were studied show higher concentrations of, I would say, all nearly 87% uh, 80, of the borehors that were studied in the area have uh, fluoride concentrations that are higher, much, far much higher than 1.5 milligrams and per liter, sorry. And from 
the, the health point of view, the results of the consumption of this water resulted in um, people having mild um, uh, fluorosis to moderate and some of them, especially in the old one, show uh, severe fluorosis up to uh, where the scale shows eight to nine. And 50, 54% of the patients have uh, a score between one and seven, and the rest is higher than eight. 32% have uh, a score higher than eight, meaning severe uh, uh, cases of fluorosis. Now, in conclusion to this, uh, why I cannot move my slides? In conclusion to this small study that uh, we, we conducted here, we, uh, of course, I only presented the concentrations of fluorides in relation to the fluorosis, but we also looked at the source of the, the fluoride to confirm where does it come from. And uh, it shows, the study shows that it is coming from weathering of alkaline, alkaline volcanic rocks, which confirms the geological setting, the distribution of the fluoride in the aquifers. It's high in more than 80% of the boreholes. It's high in all aquifers in the area, and it's highest in the rift floor and lowest in the escarpment. And then the dental fluorosis, as I just explained, it's high prevalence over 80%, uh, especially in the young patients and mostly mild to severe, uh, more or less uh, between 3.5 and, and, and 7. And then it is highly uh, uh, seen in older patients. In terms, of course, of recommendations, uh, at this stage we can only make recommendations. We uh, recommend that low fluoride groundwater prospecting in the escarpment more studies on fluoride concentrations in food in order to assess its health risks because as we said it's not just the water that's the pathway people eat food that's irrigated with water and that food uh, can accumulate um, extra uh, amount of uh, fluoride and therefore uh, cause health. And then, of course, one of the easy way to start with is to educate the local po people or the local population about the fluorosis preventive measures. At least they know what's going on. And then the second example that, sorry, the second example I wanted to share with you, I hope we will have enough time to cover all what I put together, um, is iodine, and this uh, ex this study was conducted by uh, a student from Nigeria, Mary Sanyalu, and she looked at the iodine concentrations and other trace elements in drinking water from a specific area, and uh, how does that impact on the thyroid dysfunction or the observed cases of the, the thyroid dysfunction in the, the area. Again, this work is published in two papers. Uh, sorry, it's in press in one paper and it's in the review for another paper. So again, where does iodine occur? From a geological point of view, you can find iodine in oceans and, the, and sea or rainwater, in soil, and in rocks, mostly sedimentary rocks. Now, what is the health role of iodine? Iodine is required in small amounts in the human thyroid gland for biosynthesis of thyroid hormone. Well, it's not just actually, it's not just in human, it's basically for all uh, including animals as well. I will show an example later. So what is the thyroid gland? It is an, an endocrine gland that is found in our neck. Okay, And this, this gland produces two types of thyroid hormones, which we call T3 and T4. These hormones are secreted into the blood. 
So these hormones are very important for all the cells in the body to work properly and function correctly. If there is any destruction from the secretion of these hormones, then there is a disturbance in the function of the gland and therefore there will be health issues occurring. For example, we can have cretinism, we can have Kishinbeck disease, it can even cause mental and growth retardations in children. And of course, the most common uh, uh, dysfunction caused by the thyroid is the goiter, which is the enlargement of the thyroid gland in the neck. And this is observed also not only in humans, but also in animals, such as the case of this goat, for example. Now, the study area where Mary did her research under my supervision and that of Professor Ori Selinus from Sweden, it's a coastal terrain, which is bordered by the, it's, it's in this part of Nigeria, okay? And it's bordered by the Lagon, the Badagri Lagon to north, the Atlantic Ocean to the south, and the Republic of Benin to the west. And this is where she collected her sample water samples, which were collected in the same places where we have uh, uh, health data on goiter patients. So in geo from a geological point of view, the area is mostly uh, sedimentary made of Benin formations, Miocene to recent. Uh, it's made up of recent littoral alluvial lagoons and coastal plains and deposits. And the water samples were collected from different and treated boreholes located in different villages within the study area. Again, when I say untreated, uh, uh, I re repeat the same, uh, what I said earlier, in most rural areas in, 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 in Africa, uh, people have problems with water, therefore they uh, uh, run into uh, um, creating their own sources of water by uh, um, boreholes. So the, all the samples that were collected were analyzed for both major and trace elements. And um, the result showed that indeed, the, as we expected, the iodine was extremely high in um, basically all the samples that um, uh, uh, were analyzed. Okay, they are higher than the um, the upper limit or the, the, uh, the standard limit for drinking water. In addition to iodine, lead and arsenic were also detected in high concentrations in a number of samples in this uh, uh, area. So now from the health uh, study point of view, the health survey, the health data we, connect, we collected, um, the health record of the patient from the state governments in 2014 on a greater from uh, a surgical operation, which is a program that the governments ran in 2014 for people with greater to operate. Uh, 50 percent, uh, 50 people, greater patients were identified, and the age were, was between um 32 30 to 62 years old so um statistically 78 percent of these these patients suffer from what we call hyperthyroidism hyperthyroidism is a dysfunction of the endocrine thyroid uh, which secrete too much of hormone and this is because of high concentrations of iodine in water. So this 
numbers, these uh, statistic numbers are consistent with the high concentrations of iodine that we identified in, in, in water in this um, study, in the, in, the, in the sample study for uh, here. Then, sorry, then what we, we, we did, we superimposed uh, a spatial distribution of iodine and goiter cases. And this, uh, these maps show a cluster distribution patterns of greater occurrences towards the south northeast direction, indicating high prevalence of greater in this region. Okay, so these little squares and the, um, and the, the blue, the green are different um, greater data collected in different uh, years, 2014, 2018, and, and so on. And these little greenish things, uh, uh, rectangles are the towns in the area. Now, these maps showed also that the high greater pre prevalence area this, this in, 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 in the red spot here, corresponds also to groundwater, which is characterized by moderate to high concentrations of iodine in the studied samples, which is ranging from 40 to 378 microgram per liters, exceeding the upper limits, the standard upper limits of drinking water, which uh, of 15 microgram per liters. So this area in red here is the hot spot. Now we looked also the spatial distribution of lead and arsenic together with water cases, it showed exactly the same trend as well. So the, the areas that showed high concentrations of arsenic and high, uh, sorry, uh, lead and high concentrations of uh, 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 arsenic are the areas of high prevalence of greater. So from this study, we uh, concluded that iodine is higher than the upper limits uh, that is uh, accepted for drinking safety, uh, dr safe drinking water. In all the samples that were studied, lead and arsenic were in uh, a large number of samples, also very high, up to 70 and 8, 90% of the samples showed this anomaly. The high concentrations of iodine coupled with other dietary sources of iodine in the area such as consumptions of iodide salt, as well as the arsenic and lead could be responsible for the observed thyroid dysfunction amongst the local resident in, in the area, especially those who were uh, uh, affected by hyperthyroidism, 78% of the patients. The source of iodine, we also looked at what, where does this iodine comes, come from. Um, through the study, it shows that there is a strong positive correlation between iodine and phosphorus, which confirms the effect of anthropogenic uh, components in, in the area. And uh, this can be linked to the application of fertilizer because this is a farmland. However, in the case of the geogenic source, it can be caused by the influence of the marine environments on the groundwater aquifer in the area. I did not show all the discussion about these results because it takes a lot of time, So, but it is in the publications that will be, uh, I hope it will come out soon. Now, the second type of um, the second example that I want to, to, to discuss, I try to be uh, brief because it's already uh, uh, nine o'clock here. I believe it's time for you there. It's four for you. Um, uh, it's the geophagia, which is the consumption of earthy material, which can have harmful effects on health. In the case uh, here, we looked at the, uh, two cases, one in uh, Namibia and one in, 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 in Kenya. 
Now, what is geophagia? It's the voluntary ingestion of earthy material by humans or animals. Sometimes the birds and other animals also um, uh, consume this material. And what is it consumed? It can be anything. It can be termite mounds, it can be clay boards. Uh, it's made from clay and sometimes even pieces of rocks. And why people eat this? Uh, this is a very common habit in, in, in Africa. Um, they think it, bring, it adds some supplementation in terms of nutrients to their body. And some, in, in some cases, it's more for cultural beliefs. What are the benefits and the detriment uh, effects of this uh, practice? Uh, from a, a positive point of view or health effects, it alleviates the hunger uh, or morning sickness, especially in the case of pregnant women. It protects guts from toxins and pathogens, and it provides nutrient supplementation such as iron, magnesium, calcium, and so on. But it also has positive negative health impacts. Uh, which are abrasion of teeth and guts. Um, I will explain all these three examples later. Poisoning through the, uh, the presence of toxic elements, pathogens, injections, uh, injections, sorry, um, bacteria, and so on, and premature, spontaneous abortion, um, miscarriage, sorry, uh, pregnancy, complications and so on. So there are a number of health issues that can be associated with this practice. Now, the, the example from Namibia was studied by uh, Salma uh, Kambonga, uh, who worked uh, on, this, uh, on, the, on this topic for her master project. And she looked on the impact of the consumption of this material in one village in North Namibia and the complication that might arise from this practice on pregnant women. This work is also published in uh, two papers. Uh, all these papers, if you Google uh, my name uh, in Google Scholar, you will find all of them uh, listed there. So the prevalence of, um, uh, of this, this practice in some African countries in, is very high, and in uh, Namibia, it's up to 42%, uh, for example. This is a study from 2011, but I'm sure now it, maybe the numbers changed. The samples that were studied by Salma come from northern part of Namibia. Namibia is here for uh, our Brazilian students. Uh, um, this is the map of Africa. The geology of the study area falls within the upper part of the Uvambu Basin, which is the Kalahari sequence, and it's covered entirely by reddish brown to light grayish unconsolidated sands. I remember that we are in the deserts, we are in southern part of Africa. So this is how the material looks like in the field. Uh, in this case, we are dealing with termite mound. You can see how big they are. This is Salma standing here. It's, she's small in size, but not that small. It's actually, this is huge. Um, so, these are here some examples of uh, close-up of the material that was consumed. Now, from a trace elements point of view, what the study revealed was that uh, arsenic, vanadium is higher in all the samples that were collected. Nickel and chromium are higher in some of the samples. Now, from a health point of view, the, the, the highest, the, the, the high concentrations of these elements cause serious health issues. In the case of arsenic, we can have miscarriages and vanadium, we have depressed, depressed growth, anemia, and even death. And in the case of nickel and chromium, 
again, we have serious health issues that are caused uh, by the high consumption of uh, um, these elements in, in, in diets. Uh, so, oops, sorry. Um, now, in, in just a few remarks from this study. This material might supply essential elements such as calcium, iron, magnesium, potassium, and so on to pregnant women who believe uh, in eating this material as a healthy uh, uh, supplement for themselves and for their fetus. However, long-term and high quantity consumption of this material with high concentrations of elements such as arsenic, chromium, mercury, vanadium, and aluminium may cause potential health risks due to their toxicity. The health data collected on pregnant women in this area uh, revealed very few pregnancy uh, complications, pre pregnancy um, uh, outcomes, um, and low birth weight and other issues related to health issue. However, uh, sorry, uh, for example, over a period of three years, uh, we have noticed 13% of miscarriage, 2% uh, of low birth uh, uh, weight, and stillbirth amongst viable babies. However, this might not be a true reflection of the situation. Remember, we are dealing with rural areas, and uh, also we deal with a retrospective collection of data, and uh, it might not be 100% correct. So we need to do a thorough um, survey in order to make sure that uh, these data are correct. But in any case, from a geochemical point of view, this material cannot do well for the consumers. The last example that I want to show you, to share with you, is from Kenya. And uh, this is, again, uh, a small study conducted by, together with Patrick, um, which is published recently in, uh, in IGA journal where we looked at the geochemical and mineralogical composition of geophagic material from uh, Beringo town, which is uh, in the Kenyan Rift Valley. And uh, now looking at the prevalence of geophagy in Kenya, it can go up to 75%, which is quite high. And the samples were uh, collected in this part of Kenya, which is again in the Rift Valley. And the geology is volcanic rocks, including basalts, trachyte, phonolites, and various stuffs. And you can see now the material consumed here, it's a piece of rock. People eat this piece of rock just like that. Uh, this rock is made of uh, uh, quartz, first part, and some lithic fra fragment, that's it. Looking at the um, mineralogical composition uh, under the microscope, we re revealed the presence of phenocrysts of uh, quartz feldspar, amphibores, um, iron oxides, lithic fragments, these are the feldspars, these are the amphibores, elmenites, and then, um, they are uh, either elongated or rounded with sometimes angular uh, shapes. And the ground mass, the matrix, is made of similar mineralogy. Now, from a geochemical point of view, I only present the toxic uh, the trace elements. Again, like in the previous case, a number of trace elements are extremely higher than the accepted values comparing to a number of organization uh, regulations such as the World Health Organization and so on. For example, the zinc, the chromium, uh, uh, cobalt, selenium, they are all higher uh, than um, the, the accepted values. 
molybdenum is higher in some of the samples, arsenic is high in all, lead is high in all, cadmium and mercury are also very high. So all trace elements are basically higher than the recommended daily values uh, for most of the elements. The health risk analysis of these trace elements showed that um, besides chromium, all essential elements have their values lower than one, which is indicating less health uh, uh, risk. And um, in the case of lead, uh, sorry, in the case of non-essential elements, apart from, I mean, the toxic one, apart from lead, the other elements also did not show any risk. However, the risk depends actually on bioaccessibility of the elements. So this is, for example, on this table, you can see chromium is showing a higher value, uh, more than one, and lead is extremely high, which is a serious uh, issue. Now, from, in, in conclusion to this study, from a mineralogical point of view, the shape of the large crystals of feldspar and quartz could be an issue in terms of health because they give uh, not only unpleasant, gritty feeling, but it, causes, it can cause dental and intestinal abrasion when uh, consumed. As I said, remember, people eat these pieces of uh, rocks just as they are. From trace elements point of view, besides chromium, which is very high, all other essential elements uh, are in uh, appreciable concentrations, suggesting their nutrition benefits. Uh, however, this can be uh, overshadowed by the toxic elements uh, such as arsenic, lead, cadmium, and mercury, which are very high in all uh, these samples. And the health risk index calculation showed that chromium and lead indicates a serious or a potential health risk associated with the consumption of this material containing this element. So overall, we cannot recommend people to continue to, um, to consume this material, although it might not show any health issues at present, but a long-term consumption of this uh, uh, material with multi-toxic elements, it might lead to long-term health, serious health issues. Now, some general concluding remarks to my to this initiative on medical geology in Africa. Um, I just want to share a few points with you. So in Africa, medical geology is not yet well developed, although it is actually in Africa that this the application of this research would be most relevant, as you have seen from some of the examples I showed. The unhealthy situation in Africa might be due to several factors, of course. However, we cannot continue to underestimate the real and the potential risk associated with the hidden geo geogenic geological factors and the anthropogenic factors such as mining, which enhances the release of the chemical elements into the environment. And it is up to us African researchers, institutions, and policymakers to define the priorities of the continent and take the lead in developing this discipline in collaboration, of course, with international science community. I do hope, uh, and sorry, and in, uh, institutions, and I do hope that we can launch such cooperation with Brazil uh, because we do share quite a number of uh, common uh, health issues and geological uh, history, which makes the collaboration much easier. And this is needed in order to ensure a very good and safe use of African natural resources and that of our and that our communities are not affected by the exploration of these resources. 
we should ensure appropriate education and awareness about the risks associated with such activities and natural geological materials in general, and we should ensure good knowledge of the environment, uh, environmental causes of health issues, which will help in designing remediation plans and targeting the appropriate health interventions to save lives who are lost because of those NCDs that are uh, listed by the World Health Organizations and reduce those numbers that uh, are shown in the report. So uh, we, I strongly believe that our environment uh, is a major contributor to uh, these such issues. And finally, I would like to thank all my collaborators. I can't uh, list all of them, but they are here. Uh, and um, thanks to them for their support um, in the supervision of my postgrad students and their training. And all my postgrad students, I only presented the work of two, three of them tonight, but the, there are others who are also working very hard. The University of Johannesburg, the National Research Foundation for all their support. And of course, my special thanks to Prof. Uh, Jerome for, uh, and the University of Bahia. And to all of you who are attending and listening to my lecture, and thank you very much. And um, I, I just want to say uh, one word about uh, Bahia. Uh, as you know, I'm Algerian, so I speak Arabic. And the name Bahia in, uh, is a Muslim girl's name. And the meaning of it, or the meaning of name Bahia, Bahia is nice. So I do hope that this lecture, you found this lecture as nice as the Bahia city in Brazil. And I thank you once again, and I say obrigada. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Professor Hasina. It was very, very nice for sure. Uh, we had many comments. I think everyone enjoyed it. It was very interesting. Uh, I think we have time for some questions. Can we? Can I yes. give you some of them? Yeah. Please. Yeah. Please go ahead. Okay. The first I one. Yeah, I can't see the questions. I only see my screen. I'm scared. If I touch something, I will. <laughs> I will do. Well, they are in Portuguese, so I'll translate for you. Okay. All right. Please do. Uh, so the first one is from Professor Olivia. Uh, if you had the opportunity to use your data uh, in the scope of, of uh, forensic geology, like in some process or something like legal process or something like that. Uh, she's asking if I had, she's asking if I had. Well, yes. unfortunately, not yet. Unfortunately, I haven't had the chance, but I do agree. This is, this is a, very, uh, uh, a very interesting link and very important uh, joint between the two. And I'm hoping that one day we can extend our collaboration to people who are working in forensic geology. And if she, if this person is interested, you please give my email address to, the, to, to, to whomever is interested. I'm open to, uh, to discussion about this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your answer. Uh, Vou só traduzir rapidinho, então, pessoal, ela falou que ela não teve a chance de usar os dados na geologia forense, mas ela está muito aberta para colaborações, então quem tiver interesse pode entrar em contato conosco no Pós-Petro que a gente pode fazer esse contato. Uh, the second uh, question is from uh, Castro Roberto. The question is, uh, if medical geology is accepted by physicians, by doctors in Africa, <laughs> Very good question. Yeah, I think this is uh, this is a, a common issue, uh, not yet accepted. I must say, uh, we are trying to dance and sing so that they can accept us. But at this time of the of the uh, of the initiative, I haven't yet had the chance 
to, to meet physicians, physicians who will be interested. You know, the problem with the physicians is, not, is because they are not researchers, you know, they, they deal with money. So they are not interested in research like us. So I think this is, this is another problem. Uh, unless we come across with, uh, with uh, doctors in health science who are really doing research, um then then we can maybe uh you know do something and as a matter of fact i just received an email from a, a colleague from bolivia who uh no no sorry not bolivia colombia excuse me originally from colombia and he's very he's a doctor and he's very interested in uh, in the collaboration so i was very pleased to read his email so that, that, but not yet in africa well it's a first step Uh, ah, vou traduzir rapidamente, então, é, ela falou que ainda não tem essa, essa conexão, porque, em geral, médicos não fazem pesquisa, né, então ela apontou isso como uma das principais questões. Mas que um colega, um médico da Bolívia, Co Colômbia, desculpa, é, entrou em contato recentemente com ela para tentar fazer essa colaboração, já é um primeiro passo. Uh, we have another question from Ismael Ramos. He's asking if there is any uh, mapping, national mapping in South Africa, where you know concentrations of some elements or mineral uh, and their relation to some specific disease or health damage. Thank you, Ismael, for this question. Unfortunately, no, not yet. This is all, that's why I said when I started with the talk, uh, we do have a lot of work done in geochemistry, geology, mineral resources, and so on, but there isn't link to health. Uh, there are people who are doing health from a mining point, uh, mining environment point of view, but they are more interested in specific elements from, from a mining point of view only but only specific elements such as lead, for example, it's very well studied. But when you go to elements like, uh, like cadmium or uh, um, arsenic or you know, chromium, no, there isn't. Not that I know, maybe I'm ignorant. I don't, uh, <laughs> ok, uh, ela falou então que tem uma, uma ampla pesquisa de geoquímica no país, né, na África do Sul, mas que essa relação específica com danos à saúde ainda não é muito clara. E tem alguns estudos relacionados principalmente a chumbo, em locais de mineração, mas é, ainda não tem esse mapeamento nacional. Uh, we have another question. Can you see it? Yes, that's that's my friend Rita. Hello, Rita. <laughs> uh, she says in the bone chart method is the material analyzed for other metals. Meta Unfortunately, not. <laughs> These people are doing this just because they think it's a way to clean, um, to filter the water from fluoride but they don't do all, oh, forget about uh, the rest. They, they, it's, it's a primitive type of uh, methods just for rural, rural use. Okay, next one from Louisa. Um, she's asking if from your research, uh, you could uh, indicate some remediation measures in the places where you collected your data to remediate uh, some high concentrations or some mitigation measures? Yeah, well, uh, from these studies up until now, what I presented, uh, we haven't yet, because they're very recent, they were completed in 2019, 2020, they're very recent. But these same students are actually carrying on with their PhDs and we carry on Uh, on similar, on the same elements, but we extend to others with the hope that they might come up with some kind of uh, remediation or at least awareness program for the communities. Vou repassar rapidamente então a, a resposta. É, não existe ainda, mas claro que eles têm isso em vista, que é ampliando o número de elementos que são analisados para tentar trazer, se não uma mitigação, pelo menos uma consciência para as comunidades que estão sendo afetadas. 
Okay, this is a very long one. I'll try to translate it. Uh, Adriana is saying that um, since medical geology is an interdisciplinary uh, science, uh, in Brazil there is a, pro a program, a national research program in environmental chemist geochemistry and medical geology, uh, which is coordinated by the Geologic Service of Brazil. She's asking if there is a similar program in Africa. Uh, unfortunately not. That's why I said earlier that I feel a little bit uh, giving this lecture for Brazilians. Maybe it's like uh, <laughs> like a joke because the Brazilians have done quite a lot. and They are one of the countries that is far advanced in terms of uh, developing medical geology. In Africa, we don't have. I must say uh, that I'm the first one that trains the, uh, a big number of uh, African students in this discipline so far. So we don't have an official program, and I'm just doing it with, the, you know, just as an, an official. Uh, uh, but I hope that we learn from Brazilians. Vou traduzir rapidamente, então. Ela falou que, infelizmente, ainda não, é, que o Brasil realmente está bem avançado nesse sentido, mas que ela gostaria de aprender e colaborar, claro, com brasileiros. Uh, so, these are the questions we have. Thank you again, Dr. Hassina. It was amazing. I'm sure everyone learned a lot. Thank you. Um, I would like to, uh, to invite again Professor Antonio Fernando and Olivia, just to close the presentation, please. Uh, nós queríamos agradecer a doutora Racina Mori. É, eu queria dizer que eu represento o programa de pós-graduação, estou aqui representando o programa de pós-graduação, do qual a professora Olivia, o professor Jerônimo, é, a professora Tatiane são professores, né? E o coordenador é o professor Ícaro. Moreira e a vice-coordenadora, a professora Gisele Radlich, e eles me deram a honra de vir aqui representá-los e poder receber a doutora Racina hoje, nessa palestra maravilhosa, excelente. E eu gostaria de dizer ainda que a gente, é, o programa de pós-graduação, como já foi dito né, pela professora Tatiane, é, está... É, totalmente à disposição da doutora Racina para a gente é, continuar com a cooperação e, se possível, recebê-la no Brasil uh, numa oportunidade próxima, né, assim que a gente tiver uma melhoria nessa questão da pandemia, para ela vir é, pessoalmente para fazer uma palestra para a gente, conhecer um pouco da nossa área de trabalho e a gente começar algumas pesquisas em cooperação, né? Mas, mesmo assim, nesse período que a gente está na pandemia, a gente já gostaria de iniciar. Eu tenho certeza que o professor Jerônimo já está, já está fazendo esse trabalho né, de, de ligação com a doutora Racina, iniciar um processo de relacionamento mais forte com a Universidade de Estrasburgo, desculpe, com a Universidade de Joanesburgo, e com a doutora Racina. Queria agradecer imensamente. Merci beaucoup. <risos> Obrigada também do Instituto de Geociências da Universidade Federal da Bahia. Mais uma vez, doutora Racina, agradecer pela brilhante palestra e certamente esse será o início né, de um longo caminho que iremos percorrer junto, seja na geologia médica, seja na geoquímica, seja na geologia forense, mas enfim vimos muitas afinidades entre a sua atuação e a atuação do Programa de Pós-Graduação em Geoquímica, Petróleo e Meio Ambiente. Muito obrigada e fique bem. Obrigada. Uh, thank you once again, and uh, just translating a little bit, they are opening the doors of Pós-Petro to invite you as soon as the pandemic allows us to travel again. You will be very, very welcome in our institute for a talk and for our future collaborations. We are very happy with this connection. Thank you very much. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity and your kindness. It's really a great honor to me. And I do hope that uh, soon we will see face to face, not screen to screen. 
uh, thank you very much once again. It has been really a great pleasure for me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Obrigada a todos pela participação e até a próxima. Siga o nosso canal e nosso Instagram. Tchau, tchau. Tchau, Thank gente. You. Obrigado, doutora Rafinha. Obrigado. Obrigado. Bye, bye. You. you must have a good afternoon. Thank you. Good night. Good night to you, too.